Imagine a health record system designed specifically for genomics, because let's be honest, electronic health records are not built for genetics. Now you can stop imagining and start using because Phenotips is just this. Phenotips is the world's first complete genomic health record system. Now you can try it for free. Just go to phenotips.com slash sign up. Again, this is a free service you can use by visiting phenotips.com slash As many up. of you may have heard, the Podcast Award nominations have just opened as of July 1st, so I need you listeners to go to podcastawards.com, do a quick registration, and then select DNA Today in the Science and Medicine category. This is going to help us get nominated. We've been nominated three other years. We're going for a fourth nomination and hopefully a win if we can get your rallying support. So please, podcastawards.com. And if you share this on social media and tag us, I will give you a shout out on the show. That's right. I will publicly thank you for nominating us in the podcast awards. So definitely put this on social media, tag us, and I'll give you a shout out in the next show. Thank you. How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. On this show, we explore genetics impact on our health through conversations with leaders in genetics. These are genetic counselors, like today's episode, researchers, doctors, patient advocates, and more. In this episode, we are asking your listener submitted questions about the Genetic Counseling Board's exam. These questions were asked through your Twitter, Instagram, and a Facebook group. To answer these questions is the president of the American Board of Genetic Counseling, known as ABGC, Adam Buchanan. Aside from his role at ABGC, Adam is an associate professor, genetic counselor, and director of the Geisinger Genomic Medicine Institute. Previously, he was a research associate at Duke Cancer Institute. His clinical expertise includes intimate knowledge of recommended risk management for hereditary cancer syndromes. He is also co-leading Geisinger's MyCoGenomic Screening Program for medically actionable genomic results and is helping to develop a health services research portfolio on patient participation, family, and system outcomes of this program. Thank you, Adam, for joining the show. We're going to be talking about the board's exam, which is on a lot of people's minds as uh, the class of 2020 recently graduated, and some of them are gearing up for boards next month. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your insight about the board's exam. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to talking. To start from the top, how can genetic counselors sign up for the exam? What is the time frame? So the sign-up information is through the ABGC website, which is abgc.net. There's a link on there to get to our exam partner, which is called PSI. So PSI is the uh, psychometric group that helps uh, prepare the exam. And uh, if you follow that link, then... It's pretty self-explanatory on how to get signed up. That has to be done by July 17th for the August exam cycle. And so for those taking it in February, do you know the deadline for that or does that differ per year? Uh, it's in January. I don't know the exact date. Probably a couple of weeks before if it's matching with the other time frame. That's right. And for those that aren't familiar, the exam is four hours with 200 questions, which is quite a lot to get through, um, 30 of those being experimental and not counting towards the score, but maybe a future question. Are there different sections to the exam or are all of the questions mixed together throughout, thinking of like how GREs and SATs are set up and how this might differ? The exam is based on what's called a detailed content outline, which is uh, derived from a practice analysis that occurs every few years. And that content outline has five sections. Uh, so questions for each individual exam taker are scrambled up within those five sections. For how many answer options there are, is it like A, B, C, D, or are there five answer options? How does the exam look? Is it all the same? It is. It, each one is uh, four options, A, B, C, D. And uh, there is not a multi-select option. So there's not an all of the above or a, a, a and C or B and D sort of uh, response option. Oh, that's good to know because uh, at Sarah Lawrence, some of our uh, questions that were kind of board style would have some of those above all. And that makes the question a little bit trickier. Um, so that's good for people to be aware of. That's one of those things that's changed over time. 
Uh, it used to be that there were five options. It used to be that some of those multi-select options were possible. But uh, the guidance that we got from our uh, partners at PSI was that those um, can be problematic from a really understanding what uh, the candidate is capable of doing. It becomes more about <laughs> test taking strategy than your actual content knowledge. It's good to see that you're adjusting as time goes on to see like what's working best for the genetic counseling community. And at the end of the day, we're looking to see if the test taker is ready to be fully functional genetic counselor on their own and have enough knowledge. Um, so, and part of that is, I can only speak for myself, but I think there are other people with me that I am not good at math. I think that's one of the reasons I went for genetics and not other more math-centered areas of biology and science. I'm learning that there isn't a calculator provided on the exam. You can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, what can people expect to be given when going into the exam, other materials? So you're right that it's there's not a calculator provided or available. Uh, you can have... Uh, scratch paper that you use to work on problems. It's not designed to be intensive uh, calculations on the exam. So it's not like you're having to fill that piece of scratch paper with calculations for a particular question. Uh, it's more focused on concepts than uh, making sure people can do math correctly. So easier math to work with, as long as you know how to set up your Bayesian, then you should be able to play with the numbers and it's not going to be a uh we're really testing on the math, but more the, the procedure of what you're doing um, for the question, which is probably uh, good for people to hear that are a little bit nervous about that part of the exam. Um, we have a bunch of listener questions that were submitted um, looking to get insight on the board's exam from you. The first one is from Jen and Brooks, who ask, what book resources do you recommend to study for boards? What is the best strategy? Because there are there's so much content to cover, so it can be kind of overwhelming uh, when starting out or even during studying to say, am I really covering everything I need to? The detailed content outline is broad, and uh, starting with that and seeing what's on the, on the content outline is a great place to begin. Uh, it tells you the major areas that are going to be asked about. Uh, and when I mentioned that it, the exam was more focused on concepts than details, that often applies to how we should individual question is phrased. So it's seeking not to understand whether you can make a distinction between the 2019 versus 2020 NCCN guidelines for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, but rather whether you understand some of the larger issues like what are the risk management options uh, in hereditary cancer syndromes. So uh, it flows pretty well from the training that everybody has had. There's pretty good coordination there. So I would suggest starting with the detailed content outline, which is available on abgc.net and uh, working off of that. And we'll link to that in the show notes as well if people uh, aren't familiar with that, because that is helpful to sit down and be like, okay, how am I going to make this study plan? And going off of that is going to be a, a good way to start. Um, speaking about NCCN guidelines and you know not having to know specifically like between the guidelines, is there any other content that is specifically not on the exam. So I'm thinking of other things that maybe I've memorized for grad school, like carrier frequencies or other um, specific more details. Uh, is there anything else that occurs to you that you're like, oh, don't bother studying this because it's more about concepts? Not any particular topic, but in general, what the certification exam committee has done in concert with the item writers is to work to move away from uh, those questions that get at you know, very specific details like carrier frequency and seek to really address those larger concepts because we can, we can look up those details in our practice. Uh, it's, it's the concepts that uh, we wanna make sure everybody has under their belts. So each item on the exam falls into one of three cognitive levels. Uh, the lowest of which being recall, followed by application and analysis. So as you might imagine, the, the third of those is the more uh, involved one that asks you to really apply that particular concept. So there's a mixture of those scattered throughout the exam within those cognitive levels. And uh, when it's recall, it's, uh, it's kind of a clearer concept rather than a particular detail that you need to recall. 
And when looking at those three types of questions, would you say that there are more of those higher level thinking, that last category you mentioned on the exam, as opposed to the more straightforward recall questions? Or is it an even like third for each? It's scattered among them. Uh, and it differs by the section of the detailed content outline. You can actually see that on the content outline uh, as well to see how many fall into each of those cognitive levels per section. Sounds like it's worth printing out and putting on your whiteboard or something so that that's uh, always centered when you're studying as being a really good guide. Um, we have another question that kind of goes back to dates for the exam. So it's offered right now in August and February is the two months that it's offered over the course of the year. Lauren asks, what's the best take date to take them, fall or spring? Which spring, it's February, so it's not quite spring, but I understand what she means by that. Right. Uh, late winter. We're hoping it's spring is coming right. to in February. <laughs> so it really depends on what someone's circumstance is, both with work and which state they're working in. Uh, in terms of how people perform on the exam, there are not any significant differences between August and February. Uh, we've looked at that for several years now since we've been offering the exam twice a year and haven't seen those differences. So what it comes down to is what somebody's employer uh, needs, what their state needs for licensure, if it's a state with licensure, and uh, those sorts of circumstances. And with the states that have licensure where you need to pass the board's exam in order to practice, some states give you, uh, I know in Connecticut, uh, they give joint counselors a year. So if you graduated in May, you have a year having a temporary license before before you have to pass the boards to practice in Connecticut, and I'm sure it's it's similar in other states. How quickly is this um, enacted? If you pass the boards on a Monday, can you start practicing that next Tuesday, or does it take a little bit of time to actually process the paperwork? It depends on what the state needs for verification that you passed. So as soon as you finish the exam, and uh, assuming that you passed, you'll know that right then in the testing center. Uh, and that record of your having passed the exam will be available um, quickly thereafter uh, through ABGC. We don't send certificates out to everybody until the end of the exam cycle. So that would be the first week of September, typically. Uh, so if that licensure body needs that certificate, um, it wouldn't be, you know, until sometime in September before you'd be able to send that. Um, they can verify through the ABGC verification system, though, if that's the way that state works. Okay, so it's going to depend on the state as a lot um, has to do, because some states, as we said, have licensure and others do not. I think New York doesn't, um, if people are kind of New York, Connecticut-based listening. The most popular question um, we have gotten is, is hands down, if there is a percent passing rate, so for instance, you need to get, say, 75% on the exam in order to pass, does this exist? Or if it does, is it public information or is this really more in the back end of scoring? So there is some complicated nitty gritty about what it takes to pass that uh, we probably don't have time to get into here. But the gist of it is that there's not a score, so it's not like an 80% and everybody who scores above that passes, but rather what's called a, a passing point. So of those 170 questions, uh, how many do you have to get correct to pass? And that changes uh, every time that practice analysis and that detailed content outline is done. It has to be reset through a uh, a process led by the psychometric group that we work with. So there is a point that occurs uh, within each exam, but uh, it can vary from exam to exam. So not a direct number to give for people to say if they're taking the practice test, for instance, to say, oh, okay, I've gotten this score, I know I would pass on the exam. Is there a way that when you are taking the practice exam, which is offered through um, you guys at ABGC, to know okay, if this was my real exam, I would have passed? Unfortunately, no. That uh, practice exam is not tied to any um, of the kind of current way that the exam is administered. So uh, it's not going to give you a clue into passing or not passing, at least not in a very detailed way. Uh, I think the greater utility of that exam is just getting a sense of questions and topics and uh, you know, what it's like to sit down and work through an exam like that. It can be a really good way to study just so that you're familiar with how the questions are 
phrased and the different types of questions there are, as you mentioned before, that there's three different types. And I think for a lot of us that took GREs to get into grad school, um, taking a lot of practice tests was a good way to prepare us for that. So kind of similar continuing of that kind of study skill. Haley asks, is there a best way to approach the questions? Is there, when you look at a question, a certain thought process that you have to go through and hopefully zero in on that best answer? A lot of the skills from taking those other standardized tests apply here as well. So really stopping and reading the item and the response options carefully. Read each response option before you think you've got the right one picked out. And uh, just be careful and thoughtful about the process. The other thing that I think is helpful is to uh, really zero in on the way uh, it's phrased. So often they're phrase to ask what's the next best thing, what's the best option or the best approach. Uh, so you want to see how that that's phrased. And it's typically called out either with capitalization or bolding what it is that the item is looking for. So those test taking skills that people develop over time on their way to and through grad school should apply here as well. And for people that are looking to take the PRASC exam that is available through your website, I believe, when they go to do that, is it like a PDF that they receive of an exam with like an answer key at the back? Or does it actually take you through like what the uh, platform software is going to look like on exam day? It's a little bit different uh, from the way the exam software looks on uh, on exam day. So it's more of a kind of representation of items and and uh, what the response options are, but it looks doesn't look exactly like the display that they'll see in the testing centers. Question about the scoring of the exams. Sophia asks, uh, will scoring this round of exams factor into these unprecedented times in light of the added stress of the pandemic with classes being online towards the end of the semester and rotations being cut short specifically for the class of 2020, which I would imagine is the majority of people taking the exam in August and February, but obviously other genetic counselors as well. Um, I'm sure that ABGC has had conversations about how to handle this. Is there any differences with this round of testing? I'm certainly sympathetic to people who are entering the profession now. It's an extremely challenging time, and it is uh, similar to a lot of what uh, our other healthcare colleagues are going through, uh, for example, with interns just having started yesterday with their first day in their, their new jobs as physicians. So uh, we are recognizing that people are, are entering the profession at a challenging time. The scoring uh, is not uh, going to change uh, because of the way that it's designed and having uh, gone through the process of setting that passing point. And I think that's appropriate in spite of the challenging times, given that uh, we need to make sure we're maintaining uh, the protection for the public that uh, the exam provides and the uh, rigor for the profession. Yeah, I think that's well said. And and there are some positive sides that some people have had more of a chance to study with, uh, you know, specifically at, at Sarah Lawrence, we had classes end, um, or not end, but begin to be online towards the end of March and didn't have in-person rotation. So a lot of people had extra time to study. So there's definitely a, a balance there where you maybe didn't get as much time in in-person classes and rotation, but had more time on your own to study. So, you know, I'm sure things are, are shifting, but definitely a hard time for people to um, sometimes be studying and be prioritizing this. Um, but yeah, the, the field, we can't exactly, um, you know, take a step back and, and reduce our expectations. Um, going along with that, Sarah asked, do you expect the pandemic to have any effect on the results of upcoming exams? So, you know, going along with class rotations being online, if you expect there to be a, a dip in the passing rate, um, which has fluctuated the past few years, but it seemed to be between like 75 and 90 percent? We'll definitely keep an eye on it. It's hard to know what to expect. Uh, you're right that typically, especially for first-time test takers, it's been about an 85 percent rate for those who've passed. So uh, we will know in September what that rate was, and uh, we wouldn't necessarily be able to attribute a lower rate if it were to occur to pandemic or to um, social justice uh, protests and concerns and uh, or anything else that might be going on in the world now. But uh, we'll definitely keep an eye on it. 
And Christina asks, how are test taking centers and ABGC protecting test takers when it does come to COVID if exams are, exam centers are going to say 50% capacity or something along those lines, test takers are required to wear masks. Uh, what might this look like in August? And we can't really speak to February yet, but maybe more for August. Sure. So the test centers are requiring that everybody have a mask. And uh, so that's really important for everybody to know they cannot take the exam without being masked. So uh, that's critical. The other thing is that they're operating at around 50% capacity. So it differs by kind of state to state and there, there are several international test centers as well. So they're taking the uh, guidance of their local health departments or national health departments and uh, setting their capacity accordingly. Yeah, which is appropriate and for people to know ahead of time that they're going to be required to wear a mask and to double check with their specific testing center. But I'd be surprised if they weren't having to wear a mask and to find one that's going to be comfortable because if you're taking exam for four hours and you want to be focused, um, finding one that's really going to work for you during that time. Um, another question kind of going along the lines of a lot of conversations that have been occurring more so in the genetic counseling community. Audrey asks, regarding accessibility of becoming a GC and helping to expand diversity of the field, are there any plans for reducing the price of the board's exam, which I believe is about 900 Um and if there's been conversation there, I mean, obviously, this is not something that happens overnight. But if you could kind of share what ABGC has been talking about in terms of um, the price of the board's exam and helping to expand diversity kind of within that. We review the price about annually in the time that I've been on the board. Uh, so it is something that we have an eye on. Uh, and I anticipate that we'll discuss that as part of our larger discussions around diversity and inclusion in the field. Uh you may have seen that uh, we've had uh, a Twitter listening event recently to hear more about uh, people's thoughts about diversity and inclusion in the field, specifically with the role for ABGC, and uh, that we're taking several steps to uh, impact the diversity uh, of our profession and work with our other partners in genetic counseling organizations to ensure that the profession better mirrors the patients that we serve. Yeah, definitely. And for those that may have missed that, it was, I believe it was hashtag ABGC listens. Um, and so we can link to that in the show notes as well. So you can go back and read through the tweet chat that happened, uh, I think a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, I'm losing track of time during COVID. Speaking more to the phrasing of boards questions, um, has there been discussions about altering the phrasing of board's questions to be more inclusive um, towards our community, our patient population, as well as the genetic counselors in our community? It's an important question and, and it's something that we are actively working on. We've long uh, worked in the um, item writing process to remove descriptors that, that seemed extraneous uh, or prone to bias. Uh, but now we are looking to get internal and external uh, guidance on reviewing the item bank. Uh, in other words, the group of questions that we have available for each exam and uh, reviewing it for that implicit bias and uh, making corrections if we find it. Definitely. And it's very important to see that. And a lot of the conversations we've had here on the show you can look more to Twitter is great, uh, hashtag GC chat. A lot of these conversations have been happening, especially in the past couple months. Um, so you can kind of continue educating yourselves, listeners, by going there. And we're going to link to a lot of things that we mentioned today during the show in the show notes. Thank you, Adam, for coming on the show and really exploring all this. I think it's going to be helpful for people studying for boards to be able to really get a better sense of what they're expecting on test day and what mindset to be in and what to study. Any final tips for our test takers out there? I will mention one thing that uh, I think you'll see coming out soon. I don't want to get ahead of an announcement from ABGC, but we have been exploring remote proctoring for the exam uh, again because we're really focused on safety with this administration and we want to uh, explore all options for making sure that everybody can take it in a comfortable environment. So stay tuned for uh, any announcements on that topic. We'll definitely be sharing that on our social media if that's posted there. Um, so we'll be looking out for that. Is that 
you may not be able to answer this, but I have to ask, is that possibly going to affect people that have already signed up for August boards? It should be something that uh, can be changed in the time between now and the deadline for signing up. Okay, that is a good tease. Well, thank you so much again for coming on the show and sharing all of this with us. Um, Best of luck to all the test takers out there. um, And we'll be sure to kind of check in and see how the board's exam is going to change in the next few years. And really appreciate you coming on to share all of this insight with us. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk. Uh, I think the exam is stronger the more people that we have involved and the more diversity that we have among our item writers. So I would encourage everybody to... uh, become involved in ABGC as I can. Learn more about the exam again at abgc.net and a bunch of links that we mentioned in this episode is going to be in the show notes, which are available at dnapodcast.com. So you can go there for all the information that we talked about in this episode today. Also, if you are interested in your becoming a genetic counselor, we've had quite a few episodes that explore this. Episode 87 and 97 explore the application process and interviews. And episode 101 is a match day celebration that was recorded um, where we talked about what to expect in your first year of grad school. And there'll be many more episodes to come about becoming a genetic counselor. Please follow us on social media just search DNA Today. And any questions you have for myself, Adam, any previous guest, or you want to connect, email in info at dnapodcast.com. And I have to ask you for a big favor. The podcast award nominations just opened, and this is a people's choice award. So whatever the listeners like is what ends up winning. So please go to podcastawards.com and nominate DNA Today in the science and medicine category really easy. You just go to podcastawards.com, quick registration, and scroll down to the science and medicine category, select DNA Today. And if during registration, you can click off that box where it says you'd like to be eligible to vote because first nominations happen and then voting to see who actually wins for the science and medicine podcast award. So please podcastawards.com, select DNA Today for the science and medicine category. I cannot do it without you listeners. So please and thank you. And an announcement the we've had different series on the show we started out with the infertility series that had seven episodes where we explored so much like pgt and ivf and all kinds of different areas of infertility and genetics now our next series is going to be about direct consumer genetic testing and the tests that kind of surround this area so that's going to launch next episode on july 17th so in these episodes we're going to compare different companies and 23andme is actually going to be a guest on the show and Greb, for those who may know of her in the genetic counseling community. And we're also going to explore the technology used in these labs. We're going to discover the ways in which DTCs are utilized in law enforcement, carrier screening, newborn screening, cancer, ancestry, ethnicity, and so much more. It's going to be a packed series with so many experts on the show sharing their insights and all different angles of DTCs. And we kind of had a couple during the infertility series, but we're going to launch much more into it. Again, that series launches next episode on July 17th. I want to also thank Picture Genetics for being the sponsor of this upcoming series with their kits. Uh, You can join me in using DNA Today code for 25% off and free shipping at picturegenetics.com. But you'll hear much more about that in the direct consumer series that's launching again next episode. Are you still drawing pedigrees by hand? It's 2020 and you are overdue for an upgrade. Phenotips provides a free digital pedigree drawing tool. Not only is it intuitive and easy to use, it's two and a half times faster than your pen and paper. And we all know time is very valuable in the clinic. You can start using it today for free by going to phenotips.com slash sign up. This pedigree tool is one of the many features of Phenotips platform, which includes standardized symptom capture and diagnostic insights. Many of us are continuing to adjust to telehealth appointments and working from home, and Phenotips is helping by making remote collaboration much more streamlined within your team. This platform is designed specifically for your workflow in genetics. Play around with it and let me know what you think. Again, you can sign up for free at phenotips.com slash sign up. I also wanted to tease the Phenotips speaker series later this month in July, one of which I'm going to be hosting. Further details to come, so definitely stay tuned. Thanks for listening, and join me next time to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. DNA.